thank you very much for having me here. I should let everybody here know that I'm far more at home in this meeting than in any radiology meeting. Um, also to the faculty, um, I, I, the radiologist may or may not have maintained the dress code. Please correlate clinically. <laughs> so um, I'm going to just start out with a quick uh, couple of few, uh, few frequently asked questions that we have. How soon can we scan an MRI post-operatively? You can scan as early as 24 to 48 uh, hours. Um, what is better, 1.5 or 3T? It's not always that bigger is better. So a 1.5 Tesla scanner tends to give you less metal artifact. So sometimes that, that is a better option to take. Is special software needed? We can scan without special software as well as with special software. Obviously, the, when we use the special software, we get better images. And when you use them on a 1.5 Tesla scanner, then you can get even better images. But that being said, we can still be diagnostic irrespective. Um, does the prosthesis location matter? Yes. A uh, hip is generally an off-center structure, and that tends to not be in the center of the magnetic field, and therefore has more artifact. The knee, on the other hand, can be brought to the center of the magnetic field, and therefore the artifact can be less. Does the shape matter? Yes. Rounded structures tend to produce more artifacts. Linear structures tend to produce less artifacts. And finally, does the material matter? Yes, so cobalt chrome uh, and, and, and stainless steel will produce more artifact. On the other hand, when you things like oxygenium, zirconium, and other stuff, you will get less artifact from it. So because of all these reasons, essentially, what we end up doing is we're not entirely sure how clear the image is going to be when we do the scan. And therefore, in most situations, we'll also get a CT done. And as you'll see, the combination of both those things can be quite helpful to us. So what do we want to do, as Dr. Londe explained previously, some of the things that we're looking at is prosthetic position, uh, impingement, uh, bone and bone prosthesis interface, fluid and infection, and then heterotopic ossification. Now, before reading any MRI scan, I always ask one very, very important question. I call up the referring physician and I say, is this your patient or was this patient operated somewhere else? Because then I know that I should go nuts or I should just hold back on everything. <laughs> so Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm all about looking after everybody. So sorry, this image has just gone off a little bit. But I think all of you know that radiographs will give us a, a, you know, a really nice idea of certain aspects of position. CT will give us a good picture of the antiversion and axial positioning. Um, liner displacement and wear, as well as some of the liner fractures will be seen better. So um, you know, here, as you mentioned, sir, there's a fractured ceramic cup. Um, and a metal artifact at times uh, may be a, a, a bit much to make these assessments. But that being said, what can we see on MR? So when we go to good image, we can see here an oversized cup impinging on the traversing iliopsoas muscle anteriorly. Um, we can see, uh, yeah, here in this case, you can see a screw projecting posteriorly right next to the sciatic nerve. So you can see that situation here on the sagittal images as well as on the axial images. You may oftentimes even be able to see a neuroma forming along that. Um, we can see these situations where there's metallic artifacts sitting in the region of the sciatic nerve and you can see associated muscle atrophy. Um, we can see this case here where you can see there's ischiofemoral impingement. You can see the sciatic nerve is actually squashed and deformed and you can see a lot of high signal from almost like a, uh, ischios, uh, you know, uh, ischiofemoral bursa formation there. Um, here you can see something where you've got a suture and it's rather interesting the suture material and debris is running along the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve in somebody who has anterior thigh pain that is post-operative. Um, when we move on from some of these aspects, we think about the bone prosthesis interface. That's something that always tends to interest us. Um, so here's an example of somebody who has a, a CT and an X-ray that look relatively normal, but complains of consistent pain. And here on the MR, you can see that there's significant bone marrow edema right here along the calcar and medial aspect of the femoral shaft. And this is just an evolving stress reaction. If you did a bone scan in this patient, that, that area would light up. But I think with MR, we get more than just the bone. We get other structures, and therefore, I would go towards that direction. Um, here's a patient who, again, you have a femoral stem, which is looking pretty good here. But when you look at the MR, you can actually see that there's a fluid signal between the prosthesis and the stem. And this is essentially membrane formation or poor osteointegration happening along the stem itself. Um, here's another case where you can see, on the other hand, you have bone destruction. So here's a large osteolytic lesion on MR. And then here with the artifact coming in from the CT, sometimes it may be harder to see, but you can see that there's the same area of osteolysis here as well. Um, uh, one of the other things that, sorry, uh, one of the other things that we see oftentimes on MR, which is hard to pick up on CT, you get for free a look at the other hip. And so this, you know, somebody who had a painful hip, but has actually developed a subchondral insufficiency fracture in the opposite femoral head. So you can pick that up on MR really nicely. 
The question that everybody asks, CT or MR, what would you prefer? And my answer is go with both because they can both be very helpful. And I've shown you some examples here. Here, this looks like very obvious osteolysis sitting on the superior aspect of the acetabular cup on CT. On MR, unless you were experienced, you would be hard pressed to find this. Um, what we can look at is on multiple imaging planes and we can actually measure that osteolysis area and it's actually reasonably accurate. Here's another case where on CT you'd be hard pressed to call this area of osteolysis but on MR it's clear as day here that this is a large area of osteolysis along the anterior stem. So I think both modalities have their uh, role in assessing this. Here's an example of somebody on CT, you would see just this area of scalloping and maybe some soft tissue going here. On MR you can very clearly see the area of osteolysis with all the debris inside it. So when it comes to the bone prosthesis interface, uh, you know, we can see stress reactions, we can see the areas of, post in, uh, po of poor osteointegration, we can look at osteolysis and we can see changes on the opposite side as well. Moving to fluid and synovium, uh, we can obviously look at uh, the presence or absence of fluid, uh, the communication with structures, and we can characterize this fluid. I'm going to show you sort of how we can do that. So here's some common fluid collections, the iliopsoas bursa anteriorly, the greater trochanter posteriorly and laterally. And oftentimes when we're looking at these images, we can see that this fluid is actually tracking into the joint. So most of the time when you see a GT bursa or you see iliopsoas bursitis, it's actually communicating with the joint. Um, Here's somebody with, you can see some periarticular erosion along the acetabulum and it's a large collection along the femoral shaft. We have great cases where we can actually show the infection running along the entire shaft, what distance of this is involved, as well as the uh, periarticular collection. So it's helpful for you to understand sort of in a large view how much of the bone is involved and how many structures are involved. When we're looking at the synovium itself, we can see sort of here, this is a slender synovial lining here, which is pretty typical for just a reactive effusion. We can see somebody who's got a more chronic effusion where you can see thickened lining here. We can see sort of this irregular shaggy lining along with some particulate debris here and this is somebody who potentially has liner wear. Um, if these had artifact, this could be somebody who's got actually met metal in it. Um, and here you can see a more sort of solid uh, appearance in somebody who would have had alval or something like that. Um, Here's an example of an infected total hip. You can see clearly poor osteointegration. You can see edema and irregularity around the cortical shaft. You can see synovitis along the hip. And here on the CT, you can see an evolving path fracture as well. Um, heterotopic ossification is another thing that we talk about. Um, and here, MR is very helpful because besides seeing the calcification, which you might see on an X-ray or a CT, you can actually see the edema around it, which is an indicator of current activity. So here's an example again. You see edema in the gluteal muscles here. You can see the heterotopic ossification here, and you can again see more of this calcification in this region. So what I've tried to do in, uh, very quickly here is to give you a sense of how we can, what we can do with helping you with prosthesis position, uh, impingement of structures, how we look at the bone prosthesis interface, uh, fluid and how we can help you characterize it, infection, as well as uh, heterotopic ossification, among a few other things. Uh, what I will sort of the take home message to you is that following a radiograph, I think MR and CT are probably the best uh, next step forward in your evaluation of patients, especially in those where you have kind of, um, you know, significantly challenging and not obvious clinical findings otherwise. Thank you. Mm -hmm.